Now you have a different stimulating factor that's attached to the same thing. So my question in that very confusing explanation for this whole situation is, when was the last time that you felt that same kind of memory that you can literally play it out in your head? Was there a game you were creating? Was there a thing? Was it the first day you run with it? I want to talk about aliens because I think I am one. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to stick to this. Stop trying to steer away from the topic. And this is what people often do. They get uncomfortable. They want to joke or do something to steer away. It's a distracting factor because right now your brain's in a panic mode and there's nothing wrong with that. I want you to sit in this uncomfortable moment for a second and realize that you're okay. Realize that everything is okay. Realize that there's something there and I know you know it's there. <clears throat> you wasted two minutes of my life, Chris. <clears throat> I'm going to send you an invoice for that. Let me switch over to me now. <laughs> Does it work? Yep. Oh, okay. Are we getting somewhere? I'm good to go. Okay. (laughs) Welcome back to Talk Hard Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We are still live only. Today is going to be a little bit different than normal. I'm not normal. (laughs) Chris is definitely different. Um... So you'll notice that Marty's not here, and it breaks my heart to say this. Gosh, I can't. I I try to mess with people, but sometimes I just can't. Marty's on a journey right now, ladies and gentlemen. Marty needed to do some self-reflection and take some time to go on a new journey. Um, This podcast is all about growth. It's all about life changes. It's all about pivotal moments and, and what do you do in certain moments. And right now, Marty wants to focus on family, and he wants to focus on new adventures and he really just wanted to take some time to reflect so for a little bit you're gonna have to put up with me i know i'm sorry but i'm not alone christopher you're never alone christopher this is chris cobb ladies and gentlemen he is the man the myth the legend the guy behind all of the noise that we create here And he is going to be joining me in creating some fun and new, interesting topics, I guess is the word. See, I was talking to somebody today and I I realized that my vocabulary sucks. I'm very um, uneducated in, what's the word, Chris? Come on, help me. See, this is what I'm talking about. School. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'm very uneducated when it comes to school. Um, I was enrolled in high school. I just did not attend very much. So I did that bare minimum because I just had other things going on in life. So I just wanted to focus on other stuff. But today I just want to kind of touch base on what we are going to do moving forward for a little while. And that is focus on I'm on an attack mode right now. We live in a space in this country where we're being controlled. We're being manipulated. We're being um Everything is misconstrued on so many levels. And I know that I'm not the only person out there that gets like this, this feeling in my gut. Like I get this gut wrenching feeling that something just doesn't add up. I can, I can smell the bullshit from a mile away. Chris, tell me what you thought. Come on, join me in this conversation. It I talk me. to myself all the time and I'm used to that part, but I don't usually talk to myself with somebody. <laughs> uh, what'd you say? <laughs> I know that I'm not the only one that is watching all of this stuff happen. We recently touched base um, last night, actually, on the Sound of Freedom. And we are going to dive into that within the next few weeks because I'm having a hard time really being okay with the way that they are trying to, again, take away from what America is clearly in love with. I mean, you. That I'm, I'm a big believer in data. I'm a big believer in facts. I'm a big believer that the proof is in the pudding. So the writing's on the wall. Numbers don't lie. People do. And so the numbers have spoken. It came out against other movies. It did very, very well. And everybody is now trying to say it's all a hoax. It's all a, a bunch of BS. And it's just uh, the far right and the far left. Like, we are at war right now. And I don't think that America understands this. Like, listen to me very carefully. We are at war. War is not about killing people. War is about a shift in power. And that is what we are experiencing right now. Every other country out there wants to be America. So they are using everything they can against us to turn us against ourselves. And we have built this country on unity and we are watching it fall apart because of what's happening right now. 
So Chris, why don't you tell me just a little bit of your thoughts on what you're seeing and what's bothering you? Cause I know that as a fellow addict, we typically like to go down the rabbit hole real quick. We're being attacked, whether anybody <laughs> believes it or not, we're being attacked. Um, if anybody's ever read the book art of war, it talks about the best way to actually win a war is to never have to fight in it. So you use deceit and you use uh, malicious natures and you use manipulation and you make people turn against themselves and then you don't even have to fight. And that's what we're doing right now. We are, we are tearing our own country apart from the inside. So they don't need to go to war with us right now. So our politicians are definitely not helping by any means, but... I know you're seeing things like and I, we've talked about a lot of this stuff before and you're seeing the way that the media shifts things and, and the focus on certain things while they're trying to distract us from other things and, and the way that they are genuinely manipulating what is happening in America today all the way down to this whole Andrew Tate situation, which he's coming back around now. He talked about it this morning. I was listening to an interview he had with uh, Pierce Morgan, I believe. Oh, no, it was uh, Tucker Carlson. And he says the power of the media is at a point where tomorrow, if CNN went out there and told everybody that we've all been lied to, that the sky is green and they stuck to their guns, I would be willing to bet that inside of two weeks, <coughs> our schools would be teaching children that the sky is green. So, so when you say war, can we use the word civil war? I don't even think it's small. We're literally at war. Yeah. There is another country, multiple countries that I believe are doing certain things to take control. COVID was real. I'm not disagreeing with that. It was a very real thing. However, the manipulation amongst it has caused Americans to turn against each other where it's like, I won't go near you if you're not vaccinated or, or if, if you're not vaccinated, then you might as well just be a murderer. And like all of these crazy things that they're talking about are causing a, a genuine, we are at a genuine, full-on, full-scale war. People do not have to die for us to be at war. A little difficult for me to articulate, but when I say small, I mean so many um, big in numbers, um, isolated type events mm -hmm. like the riots and school shootings. Yep. And um, I use the word civil war with the certain groups, certain cultures going against other groups and cultures because it's been blown out of proportion when any type of incident Absolutely. occurs. Absolutely. Okay. So now, now I'm following where you're at. So yeah, I would, I would agree with civil war. When I think civil war, I, I think of the, the last time that America had to do something like this, right? It was, it was the South, right? Fight. And, and it was that civil war again. I didn't really go to high school. I don't really care to be honest with you about <laughs> all of the things that happened in the past on, on so many levels because history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So yeah, I knew it was coming back around. And I think that we're in the forefront right now of the new age version of the civil war. And that is no more muskets and no more grenades, and no more BS. We are, we have now gotten to a point where you can't too many Americans are armed. Too many things are dangerous. Too many people are at risk. So if you start killing people, you cause a whole different type of problem. So rather than do that and think about it, if, if they actually started killing Americans, America would just shut down. So where's the shift in power there? Because now you don't have any financial gain. Or what Americans really care about is what the prices look like at the gas pump. <coughs> they care about their interest rates on their mortgage. I mean, I just refinanced the vehicle because we bought it out of a lease and I was shocked when they told me the interest rate. And I've got good credit. And I went, wait a minute. And they said, well, that's just where the banks are at now. That kind of stuff matters to me. I'm spending $200 more a month on the exact same vehicle that I owe less money on now to own it because I had to buy it out of the lease and transferred into a new <clears throat> loan. There was no other option. I've been making the same payment the whole entire time. The vehicle's got equity in it, yet somehow I'm paying $200 more a month. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, um, just since I don't know how to talk today, this is my first time being on here. No, this is let perfect. Me, this is what I love it. No, Chris, <clears throat> lean in, brother. Lean in. Yeah, let me uh, ask questions today instead of um, – I'm, I'm a little off topic in my head. Um, what do you think they are trying to distract us from specifically? I believe that this whole entire situation is a push for power. I know that when people are emotional, they make rash decisions. So what do we do? Let's attack their emotions. What matters to people who they marry, who they spend their time with, who their family is, who they love, what they do with their job. 
a lot of things outside of them and they're materialistic. So they're attacking our emotions. And for me, it's tough because I'm a very emotional person, but not when it comes to decision making. When it comes to decision making, I, I, I feel it, I think it, I process it, and then I run with it because <laughs> I want it to be true in its form. And what I mean by that is I don't just love the idea of something. I have to love the thing itself. And I learned that the hard way. I bought a lot of stupid stuff when I was young. I made a lot of money and I bought a lot of things because I thought that I loved them. And then I realized that I loved the idea because I spent $125,000 at a car at 27 years old and two months into it, I wanted the thing gone because the maintenance sucked. I would like park it in the back of the parking lot because I didn't want anybody to hit it. Like I believe they're playing on our emotions. So <laughs> the emotional factor involved in this whole situation that's happening right now is that they, they, the gas pump matters, but it's not emotional. Like I have to buy gas regardless. So I don't have any emotions attached to that. So they don't care about that. Now, when the gas price spiked real bad, of course, now, now we're going to turn it political, right? Oh, don't worry. We'll come in. We'll save you. We'll go out of our reserve. Now, for those of you that don't understand what the reserve is actually for is a wartime. That's what it's for. Like we hold a reserve so that we can fill up our tanks and fill up our machines and fill up all of our jets and fill up everything we need and go to war. That's what we actually use our reserve for. And we tapped into it to save America. In reality, we put America in a worse spot. Can we shift the topic a little bit yeah. since we're over halfway through? Shift already? it wherever you want. Can I turn this fan um, on? Because I'm yeah. boiling. So I want to go back to you said something along the lines of you, you buy things, you're in love with the idea of them. So I kind of looked at that as you, I can, I want to relate to that and say, talk about how we have a dream to be able to, you know, we want to do something like I've wanted to do many things and I've done many things. I've been an IT guy, a game developer, a programmer, app developer, um, website designer and things of that nature. Um, I'm a videographer, I bought, you know, I bought a pretty expensive camera and I've spent, you know, money on gear over the years. Um, but I always seem to, whenever I take on a project, let's just use a game as an example because okay. I've been doing game development for 13 years. Mm -hmm. and I've only finished two small games that never went anywhere. They were just on, you know, Google Play Store. Mm -hmm. Whenever I get to the end, I get so pumped, I get all this stuff done. Once I get to wrapping that project up, you know, um, I got a few more things to do. I'm about to release this and make a billion dollars a year. You know okay. what I mean? That's my yep. um, grandiose plan. Mm -hmm. How would you go about explaining when you get to that point where you hit a plateau and then you just, I don't know if you do it or not, but I drop off for something for a long time. Um, I stopped programming and things for three years, kind of like, Stop going to the gym for two years straight. Mm -hmm. I keep trying to get back into it and say, you know, after a couple of weeks, I'd, I'd drop off again. Yep. Um, tell me what the fuck's wrong with me. <laughs> From a coaching platform, my first <clears throat> response would be, what is your relationship to those things? Because in order to succeed, in my opinion, and my personal experience is it's all based on your relationship. And that means you have to have a relationship with yourself. What gets you up in the morning? What drives you? Is it there, there's passions, there's hobbies, there's careers. Some people are able to mix them and make something great out of it. But when you hit a plateau, you're at the end of your journey. So you hit a moment in your brain where it says, we're done. There's no more excitement left. You know, you're about to be done. So what's driving you from there? money that's not going to work right now it's learning new things once i get to a point where i you know i'm right now i'm learning things i didn't know before and the things that i do mm -hmm. once i get past so many points it, i guess it's i can't think of what's next when i get so far mm -hmm. when i say i plan this out in my head say i wanted to make a short film or a game or whatever mm -hmm. um as far as filming goes my own content it's i'll, I'll get my camera out i'll start talking and then I feel like I'm trying too hard, mm -hmm. uh, like I'm doing right now. No, I love it. I would it's, go. Keep going. Right. It's kind of, uh, I've got these incredible movies playing in my head mm -hmm. about all these ideas I, I have. I am the exact same way. Um, you know, as, as a kid grown up, I watched, you know, as a little kid, I was allowed to watch Hellraiser, Nightmare on Elm Street, I, I'm yep. really into horror. Mm -hmm. um, video games, the same thing. I've been playing those my whole life. A Ladies, he said horror. <laughs> Go ahead. Just scary movies. Um, but yeah, I, I've got great ideas in my mind for characters for movies. The cut scenes, everything. I have a photographic memory. I can see things playing in my head. Mm -hmm. I have amazing nightmares. 
I always have. Okay. Um, but when it comes to sitting down and and typing things up, writing things, whatever, mm-hmm. all I can write is say nightmare. The very the specific parts that my mind conjured up. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to adding to that, coming up with it consciously. Mm-hmm. I sit there for hours and hours and stare at the screen and okay. get frustrated and tired and, mm-hmm. you know, kick the dog type deal. Are you overanalyzing the situation? I th- I, I think so. Um, Perfection is impossible. You're not going to walk on water. Right. As much as I think I can't, I really can't. Um, walking on water is not the objective. If you're setting your goals to perfection, then what's the point? And right now, one, the main thing is probably fear. Um, cause I mean, I know how to do so much stuff with technology. What are you afraid of? Um, failure, obviously. Well, who defines the failure? Me. Says who, but what I mean by that is failure is often defined by the way that others will actually see it. So who is defined? Like, what are you afraid? Is it not perfect in your head? No. Have you let somebody else in? To get an outside perspective. I guess it's more a matter of I've never completed anything. And right now the fear is I'm going to do this and get really good at it again to where people are, are, you know, damn, how do you do this type of shit? And then I stop doing it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm talking to myself every day right now as I'm doing, I'm like, I'm not going to just drop this again, but I have every time. And I don't really remember the reasons or the excuses or whatever, because I, I even said this on a, a post the other day. Somebody posted something about fear of failure, and I said something along the lines of, it's cliche, you know, everything we want in life is on the other side of fear. Mm-hmm. You know, you use that fear as fuel and break mm-hmm. through that wall and use failure as a learning experience, you know, fail forward. Yes. And that's when I try to take all the times that I have, dropped off the map and stopped doing certain things Mm -hmm. and use those literally as learning experience as to where I learned so many things that I still know. So now the new things that I'm learning are going to add on top of those. We all know what we're doing. We know how to do it. We don't know why yet. So the why is what's going to define your success, but I get real bored with it real quick, I guess. My passion is to run a business, but I have to find a business that matters. So life coaching, podcasting, and other business adventures that I'm involved in and, and better, more efficient ways of using energy. I care about people. Like in the, at the core of me, I care about people. So when I'm not helping someone, in reality, I'm not actually helping them. I am unlocking their ability to help themselves. And when that isn't happening, I lose my drive. And I've had to tell a few clients recently, hey, I'm not your coach. We're not connecting. There isn't the drive inside of me to trigger the questions that I want to ask you because I'm not on the same (laughs) path as you. Not everybody's for everybody. So if you're missing your creative juices, why do you think that's happening? I really honestly don't know. As far as my drive of what I want to accomplish in life in general as a whole. What do you want? I don't know. That's kind of what the... You know, you just don't know that you know. Yeah, it's... uh, I have no idea. Think for a moment and, and join me in this. I just want you to take a minute. Silence is fine. I can keep the audience going. Okay. But I want you to think for a moment about the last time you felt alive in your space of creation. Like when was the last moment? And it may come to you quickly. You may take a minute. When I was um, on drugs. That's not a lot. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when was the last time you felt the same kind of euphoria that you got from drugs without being on them while you were doing what you love to do? Like, can you, this will help. What were you doing on September 11th, the day that the planes hit? I lived in Chrisman, Illinois. Mm-hmm. I was in uh, ninth grade, mm-hmm. and the math class was me, my stepbrother, and my best friend. Mm-hmm. It was a three-man class. Okay. Uh, we saw it on TV. The English teacher next door came in and said, uh, turn on the TV, and then the second plane hit. Okay. And I just remember everybody running around saying, we're all going to die. And then I walked home. If you close your eyes, can you actually visualize that classroom? I don't even have to close my eyes. Okay. Yeah. There's an emotion attached to that day. Now, if I asked you what you did on September 12th, you probably have no clue. Nope. So when you attach an emotion to something that drives you, now you have the ability to spark excitement. Now, that was a what they call a, a non-stimulated response, meaning it took your normal actions to 
stimulator response inside of your body. So <clears throat> Pavlov's dogs are very similar where Pavlov basically would train dogs by bringing food into the dog. The dog would salivate. And then after a few treatments, Pavlov would ring a bell first and then bring food in. And so then the dog started to associate the bell with the food. So all you'd have to do is ring the bell and the dog would salivate. It could be no food present. Then you have a different stimulating factor that's attached to the same thing. So my question in that very confusing explanation for this whole situation is, when was the last time that you felt that same kind of memory that you can literally play it out in your head? Was there a game you were creating? Was there a thing? Was it the first day you run with it? I want to talk about aliens because I think I am one. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to stick to this. Stop trying to steer away from the topic. And this is what people often do. They get uncomfortable. They want to joke or do something to steer away. It's a distracting factor because right now uh, your brain's in a panic mode and there's nothing wrong with that. I want you to sit in this uncomfortable <laughs> moment for a second and realize that you're okay. Realize that everything is okay. Realize that there's something there and I know you know it's there. You don't have to have the right answer. This answer can change. But what is the one you can think of now? Just uh, can it be grandiose, like my big picture idea? Yeah. Um, Having a game studio with, think James Cameron filming Avatar in 3D. Like, I know how to do certain things of that nature. It's Mm -hmm. just a matter of, um, you know, not having the hardware, the funding and things things like that. You think James Cameron always had funding? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I've managed over the years to use different, cheaper technologies to mm-hmm. mimic what those things can do. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but really, it, it's been, I've had teams, teams that didn't last. Um, sometimes it would be me slacking. Other times it would be somebody else, like an artist or something would drop off the map. Mm-hmm. And it seems like I would have team after team of four or five people from all over the world. And, you know, it would always end up um, the team just, you know, breaking apart. And then mm-hmm. slowly over the years, each and every one of those individuals dropped off the map doing different things. I don't want to make it a talk about video games and 3D modeling and all that, but it's just really all I know is. It's not about that. Don't worry about it. They're, they're listening and we're getting somewhere because <clears> I'm. I'm wanting to try something. So if we, if I, if I snap my fingers right now, I'm trying to give you guys good noise, but I don't, I don't have a. There we go. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I snap my fingers right now, and everything that you want has happened. What does that look like? <laughs> you spoke about this studio, James Cameron, 3D animation, film production. Like in a in a in a 30 second to to 60 second explanation, what has happened for that to be possible? I have worked very hard. And And built what? A virtual reality meditation app that got really big because it taught people how to start. It is really big. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is really big because it's already happened. Um, Basically, I've I've taught people how to go into these virtual worlds and be guided by my voice on how to meditate to where they could learn on their own to practice controlled breathing. Also, to teach them... How to learn lucid dreaming, um, which sounds kind of weird to most people, but dreams have always been a really big thing for me because I've always been able since I was a kid to know that I was dreaming by looking at certain things and figuring them out. And I've been able to eliminate a lot of my fears like as a kid, my fear of the dark. I didn't know what meditation was back then, but that's what I practiced without knowing it. Um, learning how to control my sleep paralysis and my bad dreams and how to kind of de-escalate situations and stop being scared all the time to go to bed at night. Pretty much um, practicing those things. I love this. Let me get really good at it. And when I stop practicing them for a while, you know, for instance, when I'm in my addictions and things like that or distractions of the world and being stressed out with, you know, broken relationships and other just uh, just all these distractions, I stop. I start forgetting, you know, where I'm coming from, who I am. But when I get back into practice and it starts happening more and more again. Okay. So there's I, you know, I've kind of figured out figured out on my own because nobody else wants to talk about it, Mm -hmm. how to. Tap into the parts of my mind that I can't tap into when I'm conscious most of the time. Um, it, it has it's kind of in part they play hand in hand. Lucid dreaming, the um, meditation, and virtual reality kind of ties into that mm-hmm. because you kind of begin it tricks your mind. You start feeling like you're in this other world. Um, it's kind of like a sensory deprivation. It's not tricking the mind. It's really happening. Right. 
And um, so, yeah, that's just something I, I had the idea to work on to teach other people and for them not to think it's so weird, like it's some weird guy coming up and saying, hey, you want me to teach you how to control your dreams? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, I decided to turn it into kind of a business model, um, tap into your mind. And it turned out a lot more people wanted to learn how to do so than I expected. So I want you to write down the the three key factors in this, and and I'll explain why I'm having you write this down. And so what I've heard is you've built an app, um, meditation, and then I want you to write down childhood, okay? Now, in a typical coaching session right now, what I would do is sit with Chris and and let him walk himself through this. But um, for educational purposes, I'm going to go ahead and explain to you, the audience, why I'm doing this. So Chris, go ahead and write down those three things, okay? So I want you to write down the... the, the, I'm going to get you a pen. Hold on. (laughs) <clears throat> so it's the it's the again the meditation right yes sir meditation vr lucid vr lucid dreaming mm-hmm. teaching so you built a meditation app so meditation app right yes okay what are the key factors do you remember besides childhood i want you to write that one down i'm going to explain why in a second and think of one okay. more thing that is there's a couple uh fear and overcoming fear yeah overcoming fear and anxiety and um emotions is what i hear so i want you to write down emotions meditation app and childhood okay now again typically i would let someone walk themselves into it for educational purposes and most coaching sessions last between 60 and 90 minutes uh sometimes longer if i'm in a session with somebody that is really digging deep i will go ahead and sit there with them but the reason i'm having you write these things down is there's an emotional attachment to literally writing something down this is why swat leaders do this this is why people in the military do this they write a love letter or a letter to someone um in recovery i've done this when i have been sponsoring people where i will say i want you to write down an obituary to your past self and we're going to bury this person so i want you to write it down and then we're going to burn it and so there's there's an emotion attached to your actual physical need to think about what you're writing uh so for those of you that want to grow in what you're doing what i recommend you do is start journaling start writing things down there's no good way to journal i know a lot of people like myself where i will just write down a bunch of keywords and i'll just write them down and i will attach emotions to them and i'll put little cliff notes on them and if you open it up it probably looks like a psychopath's notebook to be honest with you at first um there's structure to it in my head but what i'm saying is there's no right or wrong way there's no guidebook i've seen a lot of people on youtube they're like you have to do it this way no you do what works for you that's what will last so what i want you to do chris between now and the next time that we meet and discuss this topic is now that we've gotten you there i want you to write down what it would take to get there (coughs) what has changed and what are the steps to get to where you are in this moment and what we do in coaching is this is reverse engineering the situation you believe you're there now we have to write the roadmap of how to get there. And this is where I believe you are getting lost in your um, creative connection is that you went for so long where it was strictly a hobby and it was fun and entertaining. And as soon as you turned it into a career driven situation, you relied on those same factors and you can't. You have to build a plan. Change is created from plan building. So what we're going to do is build you a plan. So what I want you to do is reverse engineer the situation. So right before you launch this multi-billion dollar app that changed humanity, what happened? What if somebody steals my idea from watching this? That's what patents are for, and I'm not worried about that (laughs) because it's not that simple. Somebody can't watch this and two months later have something. And there are meditation apps out there. We're going to create the next best one. Because I'm already on board with you. VR and meditation is going to be the next platform. I'll say it now. And if you've got the money and the funding and the backing, I'm up for the competition. Do it. I'm not scared of you. I want you to be part of it. There's room for everybody. There's enough money for everybody. Trust me. I'm living this. I'm going to go home and build you a small demo. My my throat feels better now. Okay. So I want you to, to spend some time. And if this matters enough to you, then you will spend more time. If you're going to spend time that's going to take away from family, I want you to set some ground rules. Sit down with your girlfriend, kids, and say, I would like it if you would provide me with two hours on this day for me to be in total silence. I need to build a plan for our future. I usually get silence for a while because she does deliveries and things and sometimes takes her boy with her. And I understand so, that, but that's not the point. I need okay. you to set the ground rules so they understand what you're doing and why you need to get people to join you in your journey. 
Okay. Otherwise, why are you doing this? These people will, when you tell someone your plan, you're now being held accountable. If you're just going to do it because she happens to be gone, you're not going to do it. How would you squeeze that out of me? The meditation of our thing. This All is right. how this works. Cool. This is how coaching works. <clears throat> you know exactly what you want. You just don't know that you know. Your brain is like a computer. You have to unlock the boxes. You got to go in the different files. And if anybody's like me, or you've had some very untrustworthy friends, and you've hidden something in a file, you've got it buried so deep in there, sometimes <clears throat> you have no idea where it went. Let's see, Brian is my life coach. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote that down. So... This is the journey that we are going to take, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to watch. Uh, I mean, in, in case you didn't notice, we've been at this for 40 something minutes, give or take with our editing situation. And Chris has already blossomed. This is how this works. This is what happens when like minded people join each other. So if you want to change your life, get around like minded people, get into fun conversations, be willing to get uncomfortable. I know Chris was very uncomfortable in the beginning. And to be honest, so was I because I wasn't sure how this was going to go. But it went good because I believe that greatness is what's going to come from this podcast. I believe that all of you are destined for something amazing. If you don't believe that, go somewhere else, please, because you're wasting your own time. Don't worry about my time. I got plenty of it. I'm sharing this for those that do believe. <clears throat> so get out there and, and, and build yourself the same thing. If you don't know, and this is the one I want to touch on when you said childhood pattern creation, right? A long time ago. Pattern interruption. Had an interruption. A long time ago, you had a situation that you wanted to get yourself out of. I understand this on some level for me because I was afraid of the dark and I watched the bodyguard when I was very young. And I remember the dad talking about how he would just do the same thing over and over again until he got over his fear. So I would force myself to sleep in the dark until I understood that I was only afraid of my own thoughts. No, it was in the dark. It's what I thought was in the dark. And so I did something very similar. Um, and you're absolutely right. At the time, I didn't realize that I was meditating, but I was. So you have something that started from your childhood that we are going to carry with you into the future. That's how this is going to work. So we're going to reverse engineer the problem, the situation, the goal. You always reverse engineer things. You go to what's at where you want to be and figure out how to get there. So we're going to build a plan. We're going to turn that plan into a vision board. And then you're going to spend time every day staring at that vision board. Staring at it right now in my head. Love it. Your brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. And if you don't believe that to be true, the last time you had an anxiety attack was probably all imagination. But I guarantee the feeling inside of your body was very, 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 very real because that's how the brain works. So when you can imagine something, you can create something. So when you spend enough time imagining it, you will begin to attract it to you. And I'm going to prove it to you because we're going to take Chris on this journey because he's already been on this journey. I've already watched this guy grow. So... <laughs> I want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you want to talk about. We want to know what you want to hear about. If anybody is open to a live coaching session and you've got the time, I'd love to do it. I'll invite you in. We'll sit down. We'll do a live coaching session. I'm going to make you sign some documents because these are typically, um, I follow the same code of ethics that a therapist would follow you. Although I am not a doctor, I feel like one most of the time. Um, I don't have that code of ethics that I'm bound to, but my contracts are. So I'll make you sign something that you're allowed to release this information. We'll make sure it's very um, comfortable for you, but I'm willing to do live coaching sessions and you can watch all this stuff happen and you can watch how people create, or if you want to see something different, connect with us, tell us what you're looking for. Chris, thank you so much. You did an amazing job today. And I loved how in 50 minutes, We've gone from very uncomfortable to look at you. You're chilling. I was sweating in the first set because I was like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. So thank you. Thank you, audience. Give us feedback. And Chris closes out. And on the next episode, I'm going to talk more like this. <laughs> we love you guys.